Can you believe November 9th commemorated the 20th anniversary of Survivor Series 1997? 20 years! 20 years! Two decades! Holy hell! 20 years since the Montreal Screwjob. When this event happened on November 9th, 1997, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls were the defending NBA champions, and I was 16 years old and a junior in high school. Man, how time can get away from you. 20 years. 20 years later, it's still one of the most significant moments in wrestling history. 20 years later, it is arguably the most talked about match angle in the history of the professional wrestling business. It was beyond question one of those nights that wrestling fans that were alive at the time will never ever forget. It was a major turning point in the history of the WWF and the entire wrestling business as a whole. And it was a pivotal seminal moment in the history of the Monday Night Wars and was really the beginning of a massive turning point for the WWF from which they never looked back. And I can remember when it happened 20 years ago, and I think about it in a modern sense. Imagine if we had the internet like the internet we have today back in 1997. 20 years, a lot has changed. 20 years, it's an entirely different digital world that we live in today. We were just on the cusp of that in 1997. This was still at a time where you had just as many fans that still kind of believed it to be real as believed it to be a work. 20 years ago, where steroid and drug use was as rampant through the industry as it ever has. But imagine 20 years ago, if you had Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all these other social media platforms, when the Montreal screw job went down. Could you imagine? You want to talk about one of those moments that would break the internet. This probably would have been one of them. And I know I've talked about this in the past, with the Survivor Series 1997 review, with other Q&A videos, and so on and so forth over the years. But let's be honest. This event, even 20 years later, still resonates. This event, 20 years later, is still a massive deal in the scope of professional wrestling. And it feels like it's appropriate to do another video about it. Some of this may be repetitive from the past. Some of this may be new to you. All of this may be new to you. All of this may be repetitive to you. I don't really know, and it doesn't really matter, because I'm still going to talk about it anyways. Because 20 years later, it's one of those things that we never forget, and honestly, we never stop talking about. And to this day, to this day, it is interesting, even with the passage of time, how you will still have those segments of the wrestling fan base that are either in the Bret Hart category or the Shawn Michaels slash WWF category. To this day, to this day, it's phenomenal. And it just speaks to how wrestlers in that time could emotionally connect with their fans. And take it from somebody like me who's done these videos for almost seven years now, when you say something negative about a Bret Hart or you say something negative about a Shawn Michaels or a combination of the both of them, the blowback in terms of responses and the messages you get on your inboxes, on social media, the comments you get on your videos, still speak to the impact that these guys had to this day, beyond question. Now, we all know the official story, so to speak, about Survivor Series 1997 and what happened. And if you've watched me over the years, followed me over the years, you know that I'm a bit of a conspiracy guy. And you know I like to look deeper at these things, kind of take a cynical view of the world, and always ask if there's more to the story. And just like I thought 20 years ago, just like I thought a couple of years ago, to this day, 
I still believe the Montreal screw job to be one big massive work and the greatest work in the history of the professional wrestling business. And nothing and no one is ever going to change my opinion on that. It does not mean that I am right. It does not mean that I am wrong. It is just one jerk on here, me, with my opinion and the kind of circumstantial evidence that I will present in this video that will kind of make my case as to why I feel like it's crazy that so many people think that this is a shoot, that this was 100% legit and real. In a world of professional wrestling where the whole name of the game, the goal is to pull the wool over your eyes. Like this was all of a sudden the company fully and completely pulling back the curtain and saying this was 100% real, 100% legit, 100% a shoot, and I don't buy it. And here's what's typically said to kind of fit the official narrative and kind of make the case that this was a shoot, that this was 100% legit. And again, ultimately, I believe the majority of wrestling fans rationally believe in their own minds that the Montreal Screwjob was a shoot. And they look at it through this lens. They think back to, if they remember, the original screw job at MSG in 1985 involving Wendy Richter and her disputes with Vince over payoffs and getting her just due in terms of compensation and how the spider lady, the fabulous moolah, screwed her over. And you look back 12 years later, you say, Vince basically did it once. Why wouldn't he do basically the exact same thing again? Then also thinking about how when Ric Flair came to the WWF in 1991, he brought that WCW world title with him. You also had the reports that are well known over the years about at one point in time, Shawn Michaels came up to Brett and Brett said that he'd be willing to drop the title and do the favor to Shawn, to which Shawn said he would not be willing to reciprocate that in kind. You had a situation where Brett is the champion. It's just the happenstance and circumstance of how everything played out. And with what happened with Medusa and the WWF women's title in late 1995 when she went on WCW Monday Nitro and she dropped the belt into the trash can on live TV, Vince is sitting there thinking to himself, Brett's mad, Brett's leaving, he's got my belt, I don't want another Medusa situation. And you've heard all the talk for years about how because Brett felt disrespected and he felt like Sean wouldn't appreciate it, he wasn't going to drop the strap. He wasn't going to drop the strap in Canada because it was his home country. Then you see the actual event and how things broke down. And you see Vince and all of the crew out at ringside, which leads you to indicate that these guys were in on it, that there was something big amiss, something big afoot, because otherwise, why would they have been out there? Uh, then after the bell was rung, you have Brett, after a moment of kind of being shocked and realizing slowly what happened, he goes batshit, he spits on Vince's face, he destroys television monitors ringside, he goes and he signs WCW, whatever the hell. Then you've got wrestlers angry backstage, you know, even with the Hart Foundation obviously being upset, The Undertaker going and knocking on the door and demanding that Vince go apologize to Brett. You've got Mick Foley and Sonny uh, no-showing Raw the next night. You've got the reports of Brett um, punching Vince and even on the Wrestling with Shadows documentary, which presents this as being 100% real, 100% a shoot. You see Vince hobbling off and looking dazed with the sprained ankle and all of this. Then you've got Brett talking about for 20 years how he got screwed. For 20 years, he couldn't believe the WWF and Vince McMahon did this to him. For 20 years, how this was legit. You've got Shawn Michaels, Vince McMahon, and the rest of the WWE and their minions for 20 years selling you this bill of goods about how it was 100% real and 100% legit, 100% a shoot, and how shocking of a moment it was. You have the internet and so many wrestling journalists over the years providing you so-called behind-the-scenes details and scoops, telling you for 20 years all of the alleged planning that went into this everything that came about because of it and what ultimately happened, telling you that this was real. And when you think about it fundamentally, knowing Vince, knowing Sean, knowing Hunter, it's easy for you to believe 
that they would pull some shit off like this. And honestly, I can't blame you for believing that. Because Vince would do something like this. At that time, specifically, Shawn Michaels and Hunter would have had absolutely no problem doing this. And furthermore, I could understand why so many people would believe everything that Bret Hart says. Because for 20 years, he has told you this story time after time after time. And many of you that are loyal to Bret, that loved Bret during his career, just can't bring yourselves to believing that Bret is lying. Because the story that he's telling is so consistent in so many of its details and so believable that it can't be anything else other than a shoot. So I get it. Based off of a historical backdrop of a previous screw job, the original screw job, if you will, 12 years ago, keeping in mind what happened when Ric Flair did come to WWF in 1991, he brought somebody else's title to their TV. What happened with Medusa four years later when she left the company and took the women's title to WCW and what happened there. Knowing that Brett is the champion, Vince ultimately has to protect his company, protect his brand, protect his title. You can't sit there and have Brett not drop the strap on his way out and then the next night he hands it over like it doesn't freaking matter. Just let him piss on your entire company. Or even worse, maybe he's pissed off enough to where he would actually appear on WCW television with that title. Even though some of you don't believe that Brett would do something like that. It would be out of his character. You just never know. I get why you would think this was a shoot, especially when you look at the Wrestling with Shadows documentary, which in and of itself was a great and revolutionary documentary about professional wrestling. And it's a must watch, especially if this topic of the Montreal Screwjob interests you at all. I get why so many people after all of these years, and even still after this video and other videos I've done on the topic, are going to believe that this was a shoot. Because ultimately, if you've had so many allegedly credible witnesses tell you over 20 years that this was real, you'd almost come across as crazy if you believed it to be fake, if you believed it to be a work. Well, I'm that type of crazy cat that is just crazy enough to not buy into the propaganda, to not buy into everything that has been said over the past 20 years, to not believe the BS that's been packaged to me, and believe that 20 years later, this is still a work, and it still goes down as the greatest work in the history of the professional wrestling business. And here are some important questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about whether or not this was a shoot. Here are some important questions to consider when trying to kind of disseminate between what is fact and what is fiction about whether or not this was a shoot or it was a work. If it was a shoot, why would Vince McMahon have put his top belt on Bret Hart, knowing months ahead of time he was going to get to a point where he was going to set Bret free and Bret was ultimately going to leave and go to WCW? Why would he have ever put that strap on Brett at SummerSlam 97? It makes absolutely no sense. If it was a shoot, then even after that, why would Vince have kept the belt on Brett knowing he was leaving? Knowing between August and SummerSlam and November Survivor Series, you have a two and a half month or so block of time that he could have taken that belt off of him at any point in time where Brett did not have creative control, at least for that first month and a half, he could have said... You're dropping it. End of story. We'll figure out to who. Why would Vince have put the title on him to begin with? And furthermore, why would he have kept it on him knowing he was leaving and knowing that the deal was done to WCW? That makes no absolute rational sense whatsoever. Even for Vince. And then why would Vince ever allow him, talking about Brett, to get to a point where at the end of this contract, since they had invoked the out on it, that at the tail end, Brett was going to have creative control. He was no longer under contract with WWF. He was going to be under contract with WCW. Knowing that Brett could say no, why would Vince and all of the focus he's had over the years on legalities and loopholes and so many things that he's done on his business, you're going to tell me now that he's going to drop the freaking ball and allow it to get to a point where Brett Hart can decide the finish? of his match and it's whatever Brett says goes and he can hold the WWF Vince and the roster and everybody by the balls? Furthermore, 
I could understand if this was some noob. I could understand if this was somebody that got into the business a couple years before. But Bret Hart and his family were the wrestling business. He comes from the Hart family. We've talked about the dungeon for all of these years. He was the son of a freaking promoter. How in the bluest of blue fucks did Bret the Hitman Hart, son of legendary promoter Stu Hart, who grew up around the wrestling business, grew up in the wrestling business, devoted his entire adult life to the wrestling business, not have the foresight to see what was coming, especially if allegedly people around him are telling him it's coming. If it was a shoot, how the hell could he not see this coming? Then, when talking about planning out the match, and especially at the point in time in the match that it happened, why would Brett ever allow himself to be put in a sharpshooter, his own finishing move, knowing what type of storyline device that could have been? Knowing what that could have meant? And furthermore, if it was a shoot, why would Shawn Michaels have risked himself and his body in injury putting Bret Hart in a sharpshooter? Why would these guys have signed off on this move if it was a shoot? And then when the bell was rung, why didn't Brett immediately hold on to Sean's leg? Why didn't he immediately go after Sean and attack him? Why didn't Brett immediately punch out Vince in front of everybody on live television on pay-per-view? Furthermore, when you dig a little deeper, how did the WWE production truck, the crew, know to have the music cued instantly? Because typically you have these finishes planned out. Somebody else knew in that truck that Shawn Michaels was going to win at that time in that fashion, even though there were several minutes left of airtime for that show, and knew instantly what had happened. And as soon as Hebner said, ring the bell, and Vince said, ring the damn bell, cue the music, it's Heartbreak Kid City. And how did WWE's production team have every camera shot lined up perfectly? Typically when the champion is changed, when there is a new champion crowned, you go for that first initial glory shot. You at least, if anything else, will focus on the champion first because that is the dominant story. Instead, the production crew instantly, once the decision happens, the camera is shining right on Bret Hart. And then every single camera shot lines up perfectly for what happens for the remaining amount of time that the pay-per-view is on air. If this was a shoot, how the hell would Kevin Dunn and the production team have known to be able to line up everything so perfectly to be able to tell the beginnings of the story of what exactly the hell we just saw? Furthermore, if this was a shoot, why did the WWF cut the show several minutes early? Why did they end the match several minutes early? How did they know again to cue the music right away, to have all the television camera angles and shots lined up perfectly, especially if you know going into this event that something bad is going to happen, why in the hell would you allow Wrestling With Shadows and their film crew backstage to record everything before, during, and after? Has anybody ever asked that question? The same Vince McMahon who loves to have control on everything, who gets pissed off at sneezes, I hate sleeping, is going to allow a Wrestling With Shadows documentary crew backstage, and you can say they were Bret, it was Bret Hart, and they were with Bret, and he had control over Bullshit. It was Vince's show, it's Vince's company, Vince has final say-so. He allowed it to happen. Why? Especially if you knew that was the direction you were going. Furthermore, if it was a shoot, why would Vince have allowed Brett to destroy property, sign WCW in front of the live audience? Why wouldn't he have immediately had Brett escorted out by security? Think about that. He allowed the Hart Foundation to come down to the ring. He allowed Brett to destroy monitors and stuff and stand around and sign WCW in the air. And then furthermore, if it was a shoot... Knowing what had just happened, why would Vince go and confront him and allow himself to get punched? Vince McMahon, who I'm sorry, I don't care what anybody says. Vince McMahon versus Bret Hart, that's a more legit fight than a lot of people want to make it. You can't tell me that Vince McMahon is the type of guy that would sit there and just allow himself to get punched in a real life type of situation and not respond, especially when if you believe that this was a shoot, Vince was 100% in the right here and Bret was 100% in the wrong. There were just so many vitally important, significant questions that have to be answered when you're trying to sell me and others on this being a shoot.
And when you think about these questions, they just don't line up with logic. They just don't line up with wrestling reality, Vince's reality, at the time the WWF's reality. They just don't make any sense. They just don't. And that's why I fundamentally believe that this was 100% of work and the greatest work at that in the history of the professional wrestling business because to this day people still believe it to be real that said there are people that still think six years later that CM Punk won the strap at Money in the Bank 2011 and was legitimately not under contract had no agreement or deal in place with WWE and Vince put the belt on him and was going to take everything to chance here there are people that still believe that six plus years later so maybe I'm not that surprised that people would think that this is a shoot. But most rational wrestling fans would agree that six years ago, what happened with Punk at Money in the Bank 2011 was a work. So what would be so different to go 14 years back and say Montreal Screwjob 1997 Survivor Series was one big work? Think about it. One of the biggest arguments that's always used to defend the Montreal Screwjob and suggest that it was 100% a shoot was that nobody believes that Bret Hart was in on it. And therefore, as a result, if he wasn't in on it, if all parties involved weren't in on it, then it's a shoot. And to me, that's just simply not the case. You could have a work while still having somebody think and believe it is real. I mean, it's a fundamental premise of the wrestling business throughout its history. They present something to you that is a work with the hope that the fans believe that it's real. And when they do, you can make some real money. Now, that's the whole nature of the business. How could that not necessarily apply to the people inside of the business, especially somebody who was a raging mark for himself like Bret Hart? And, and think about the, the company at the time, throughout 1997 especially from the beginning of the year to this moment in time, November 9, 1997. The company had been slowly, drastically changing its creative direction. And while WCW was still reigning supreme in the ratings war on Monday nights, the WWF was slowly tar starting to discover itself, find itself, and figure out a better path forward for their creative direction and for their company. And especially at the time, knowing that Vince McMahon, when it came to big things, he did plan them out months ahead of time. He knew they were planning on bringing in Mike Tyson. He knew that they were eventually going with Austin. And they knew that. So Brett, in a few months, wasn't going to be nearly as consequential whether he was with the company or not anyways. But ultimately, I always come back to this. That while the WWF was starting to figure itself out and they were starting to do some good things and they were starting to find some guys and find an identity, they really needed something to help move the needle. They needed something to change their entire direction. They needed something to change the landscape of the business, to get people buzzing about the WWF again, to stop talking about ECW and stop talking about what the NWO and WCW were doing. They needed the attention, the spotlight, and the focus to be on them. And what better way to do that with something like this? With, with the history of what had happened throughout wrestling over the years and all of this, do you really think Vince was going to let Brett keep the title? Do you think he would have ever put the title on him to begin with at SummerSlam 97 if he didn't have a plan for all of this? I mean, you can measure Vince based off of the Vince of today. But that is not a fair and appropriate comparison. We must measure Vince based off of Vince of 1997. An entirely different Vince. Still, obviously, with his major flaws, and the product still wasn't perfect at that time. But it was much better than it is now. It was much better in 97, especially if you got to the tail end of 97, than it ever could dream of been in 96, 95, or 94, 93. They were starting to figure things out. Vince was making some good decisions. The company was making some good choices. You don't think that it would be possible or that he, Vince, wouldn't be capable of coming up with something like this? Give me a break. Then when you think about it, he had the perfect opponent to pull this off with in Shawn Michaels. Because part of this 
being a work, but wanting everybody to think it's a shoot, you want to incorporate as many realistic, real life elements as possible. Fundamental premise of the work shoot. Well, what better way to sell this off to the fans, to the boys, to Brett, than to sit there and have it be Shawn Michaels that ends up being the plot device for the screw job? Because everybody knew that Brett and Sean weren't on the best of terms, that they had their disagreements, that they weren't exactly buddy-buddy, that there was a rivalry there, that there was some simmering resentment on both sides there, especially from Brett towards Sean. If you want to push this off or sell this off, what better way to sell this as real than to, of all people, put Sean Michaels in there as the guy to pull the trigger? And what better way for it to work than for Bret Hart to be out of the loop? Because in this case, what you could do is plan everything else out and everything else is prepared. Everybody involved knows what's coming. But when it comes to Bret, the person that you need the most to sell it the most as being real, he legitimately would be left out of the loop to where he would believe it was real in his own mind. He would think it was real and therefore... He would act as if it was real, and the people would buy into it being real. All the while, the WWE has everybody in position. Everything goes off without a hitch. Just think about that for a second. Brett's reaction was pretty organic looking. He looked pissed. He looked betrayed. He looked so many other things and acted as such. Would he have necessarily acted the exact same way if he was 100% in on it? And then when you look through the perspective of wrestling with shadows being allowed there, there was a reason that wrestling with shadows was allowed to be there that night and follow Brett throughout 1997. Vince allowed that for a reason. What reason do you think that was? Because he knew that this was going to be released after the fact. He knew this wasn't going to paint the WWF in the best light. But it ultimately happened. It wouldn't have happened if he didn't allow the cameras backstage. So why did Vince to begin with? And why did he, Vince and the WWF team allow the cameras backstage that night? And then when you look at how everything went down in the short and intermediate aftermath, a month later, the Attitude Era is officially born as Vince goes on TV and talking about the fans are tired of seeing good guys versus bad guys and it's passe that they're tired of having their intelligence insulted and so on and so forth. I mean, think about that for a second, especially knowing the company long-term, and Brett even talked about it. He knew that they were going with Austin on that Wrestling with Shadows documentary. He could see it coming. The company knew that. What they were able to do is take all the heat and put it on Sean, so that way when the time comes, you could put it, on Austin talking about the title and man he's over to an entirely different level because he beat the guy that screwed frickin' Bret Hart. You can't write this shit any better. You can't plan this shit out any better. So you're telling me a company would be at risk of actually going with this as a shoot and then just would be able, especially knowing the WWF's history, and yes, we can talk about 20 years ago the fact of they didn't always adjust the best. They didn't always change on the fly the best. So you're telling me all of a sudden that Vince in this time frame can sit there and dramatically change his plans just like that if he didn't have it planned all out ahead of time? Give me a break. That allows Vince to go on TV the next week and say that Brett screwed Brett. I have no sympathy whatsoever. And he eventually transitions into being the Mr. McMahon character and the greatest heel the company has ever seen. Especially knowing that Vince believes that any good press can potentially be good press depending on how you utilize it and capitalize upon it. What better way ultimately to sell it than to have Brett go out there and go to all the media and talk about how they screwed him, talk about how this was real, and allow it to go exactly how you planned it to go. I mean, when you look at what happened, and I look at earlier in 97 as a comparison, once Sean lost his smile, it sent all the plans for WrestleMania 13 into a tizzy. It's part of the reason why WrestleMania 13 was such a disaster. You're telling me all of a sudden, several months later, even though the company was getting in a better place, and they were making more good decisions from a creative standpoint, and they were doing better things, that all of a sudden, in the scope of 1997, and looking what had happened earlier on in the year, by the time we got to November, 
They were deciding at the 11th hour the night before that they were going to screw Brett. That was going to be the shoot finish. And then they would figure out things as they went. And yet, every single thing, it seems like the next several months, in the immediate aftermath of this, came out roses for WWF. Maybe you buy it, but I'm not. And ultimately, if you say, well, all of the wrestlers reacted the way that they did, they thought it was a shoot. Actually, there are many wrestlers over the years that have thought it was a work. Furthermore, when you get caught up in the emotion of the time, especially knowing really that Brett was leaving, that was legit 100% a shoot for sure that nobody could deny. When you see that finish happen on TV, and whether you're Taker or Foley or anybody else, and you're not clued into the creative meetings, you're not clued into the talk about mapping out the match, the finish, any of that decision making, of course you're going to look at it and think it's damn real. In that moment in time, you're going to be a freaking mark. You're going to get caught up, especially if you don't know any better. So just because a bunch of wrestlers backstage acted like this was real, doesn't make it real. If anything, it just speaks to how well planned out of work it was because you didn't clue the boys in. I'm just saying. This could have totally 100% have been a work shoot with Brett being out of the loop. And that would have been what made it go. The WWF and Vince McMahon could have planned every single component of it out. And when you look at the what happened that night in the aftermath the next few months, it felt like everything was mapped out and planned out perfectly. Like it went pretty much according to plan. What better way to then sell it as well while you have everything planned out and you know where you're going than to sit there and have Bret Hart tell everybody how real it was. I mean, again, if you're talking about doing a work shoot, what better execution could you point to for implementing a work shoot? It was perfect! I mean, especially knowing how many times the WWF has brought it up over the years, the WWE has brought it up over the years, how many times the concept has been utilized, when you look back at 1997, we were getting into that place where we were starting to blur the lines between fantasy and reality, and work shoots were becoming more prevalent. This was an early kind of trailblazer for that in a lot of ways. And when you look back through the scope of history 20 years back, knowing where we are in the wrestling business now to where they were then, how could you not think it was a work shoot? I'm just saying, I'm just saying, but there's one other thing to consider, and that is, what if not only was this a work shoot, but what if Bret Hart was in on it the entire time? And I know for the Hitman fans and the dyed in the wool screw job believers that this is going to be a tough pill to swallow, and you're probably dismissing it, and that's fine, but just... Get outside of your own emotions and beliefs for a second and think about some of these things. What would Bret Hart have to gain by signing off on this, allowing it to happen, and being a part of it? Well, first of all, keep in mind, and I've referenced it in the video already, and even when you watch the Wrestling With Shadows documentary, it's clearly obvious. Bret was a huge mark for himself. He believed in protecting his character. He believed in protecting his persona. He believed that wins and losses truly mattered a significant deal. He treasured being a hero to Canadians and fans around the world. I mean, he even talked about these things himself. When you watch that, one of the things that was a bit off-putting about the documentary, potentially, was that Brett was such a raging mark for himself. And then the whole thing, I'm sorry about not losing in Canada, was really a weak-ass excuse. So you're t saying somebody else that was American that was getting ready to leave the company, had one of the top titles in WWE. He's from Tampa, Florida, but he won't lose in Seattle, Washington because it's the United States. That's just dumb. I'm not buying that logic. But when you think about it, what did Bret Hart get to gain out of this? What would have been for, them, for him to gain by signing off on this and selling out for it, basically? What I mean selling out is going all the way and committing with it. A ton of things. It's a ton of things. Brett got to still act like a mark for himself, which he was. He still got to be the hero. He gets to leave the WWF. 
for WCW with the fans unanimously behind him. Unanimously feeling that he was wrong. Unanimously pissed off at the WWF. As a result, Brett instantly, as soon as the Montreal Screwjob happens, becomes the number one babyface in all of professional wrestling. For Brett, who always loved to be a babyface, what better way to be than to go to a new company where they're paying you millions of dollars a year, getting a fresh start in a fresh place, and you get all this attention of being the number one babyface in the professional wrestling world. Nobody could touch him as a babyface at that particular moment in time. And if you believe in protecting your character and your persona and you treasure being a hero, what better way to come across as a hero than allow the WWF to play the true role of the villains and the bad guys and act like they screwed your ass over and continue to screw your ass over for 20 years? And also remember that even as you watch Wrestling With Shadows, you could tell that Bret Hart had some loyalty to WWF and felt some way about having to leave WWF after all those years and he wasn't 100% enthused about it and he was never really committed to WCW. So after all those years, what better payback for Vince McMahon and Bret Hart than to mutually part ways in a way that would be mutually beneficial? Bret would get all the way over as a unanimous babyface. The WWF could go in their direction, get all of this extra attention, and then capitalize on it. It helps the company that he's leaving. It helps WCW where he was going, because imagine the reaction when Bret Hart debuts on Nitro and so on and so forth. When you think about it, for a guy that prided himself on his character, his persona, he prided himself on the art of professional wrestling and being a storyteller, what better challenge for Bret the Hitman Hart than to try and tell this story, the greatest story in the history of professional wrestling? What better way in his mind to prove his true greatness, to prove his artistic abilities, to prove his workmanship, than to sit there and sell this as being a shoot and continue to sell it as a shoot 20 years later? And if you say that's crazy, what would he have to gain by so on and so forth, why would he have went back to the company? I think that's a fair question too, because if you realistically were screwed in this way, why would you have ever done business again with Vince? The fact of the matter is, if it's all planned and you say, hey, you'll go away for a period of time, but someday you'll come back to the family, Vince doesn't care if he gets all the shit. Vince has never cared about that. Why is he going to care now? Because Bret Hart hates him and a lot of fans resent him all these years later. He don't give a crap and we all know it. There was more money to be made by Bret Hart coming back years later down the road after having been wronged with the Hall of Fame ceremony and then several years later with the eventual story between him and Vince at WrestleMania. Much more money to be made with that type of nostalgia trip than just the standard Bret left, went to WCW, da da da, we'll bring him back in a few years later and celebrate. So much more money, so much more intrigue and interest. So when you're thinking about it from a wrestling promotion standpoint, which would you rather do? The standard exit and bring him back years later for a nostalgia pop or, oh my god, I never thought I would see Bret Hart in WWE again. What the hell is he doing here? What the hell is gonna happen? I remember what happened the last time he was here. And Brett is exactly the type of guy that would be so committed as being a mark for himself. It's a positive. He would be so willing and bought in and so committed that he would sell this and sell this and sell this. He wouldn't tell Owen. He wouldn't tell Davy Boy. He wouldn't tell Neidhart. He wouldn't tell his wife. He wouldn't tell his family. He wouldn't tell anybody. Brett was that type of guy, I firmly believe, that would be that committed to going the distance, going all the way with it, still to this day. Because at this point in time, you say, well, 20 years later, why would he sit there and still pretend if it was a bullshit work all along? Because he has nothing to gain by saying it was a work. The longer the people believe that he was wrong 20 years ago, the better off it is for Brett the Hitman Hart, his career, his life, his achievements, his accomplishments, and his legacy. And his legacy as a Canadian hero is something that he still treasures to this day.
And for those that'll get upset at me for suggesting that Brett was in on it, it's not an insult. I think it would be the ultimate testament to the quality of performer and worker that Brett the Hitman Hart was if he was in on it the entire time. I'd actually think more of him, not less, because based off of the official narrative and what broke it, what ultimately happened and went down, to me, Bret Hart comes across as a guy that was such a big mark for himself and had his head so far up his own ass that he couldn't clearly see what was coming that anybody with the brain could see, especially with this history of being a guy that grew up his entire life in and around the wrestling business. To me, that suggests that he was too busy being a mark to have any decent wrestling business sense. It makes him kind of a moron. Whereas, man, if he's in on the work, it makes him a maestro. It makes him a genius. It makes him one of the greatest workers in the history of professional wrestling. Because for two decades, he has been able to sell everybody on bullshit. And no matter what any of you say in the comments section or via social media or whatever... I still believe that's what happened. I think it's very possible because if you point to Wrestling With Shadows and say, well, he wore a wire in there to talk to Vince. Who the hell says that Vince wasn't in on it? He's the one that allowed the crew to follow him backstage for an entire year. He's the one that allowed the crew to be there that night. Who's to say, because it's not like Wrestling With Shadows followed him every single second. Not everything's caught on camera. And there are clearly times where him and Vince had interactions that weren't on camera, that weren't captured on microphone. Who is to say that this wasn't ultimately orchestrated by Vince the Puppet Master and Brett was the maestro that made all the magic happen? Personally, from a Bret Hart standpoint, from a legacy standpoint, I would rather believe that he was in on it and that it was a work that he helped orchestrate than believe that it was a shoot and that he was that naive and goddamn dumb to think that the company wouldn't have done something like that with his last night in the company when he had the world title and was refusing to drop it to Sean. So I get it. A lot of you believe that it's real. And even 20 years later, you're still going to think it's real. And there might not be a lot that I could do to change your opinion. I hope, if anything else, that this video was yet another instance where I've at least challenge some of your preconceived notions and some of your beliefs about it, maybe opened your mind, uh, expanded your horizons a little bit, and at least made you somewhat receptive to the possibility that after 20 years, the story you've been told may not be the entire story. And I assure you, no matter who tries to counter me, no matter who tries to dismiss it, 20 years later, you still don't have the full story. And if you think about it from a logical rational businessman standpoint, what do you think is more likely? That Survivor Series 1997, the Montreal Screwjob, was 100% a shoot? Or that it was a work shoot done to the best the wrestling business has ever seen or will ever see? Think about it.